Good morning, everyone. This is the Meek Street Church of Christ, and we're here today, this Wednesday. This is December the 16th, and we're here to talk about God's Word as we normally come as every Wednesday to talk about the things that are happening with us and look in the scriptures and talk about things that can help us in our daily lives. That's really what God wants, is to live each and every day with the ways of his doing things and to live a life that is pleasing to him in all things. If we'll do that, then all is well and good in our lives when we have that on our side. We're going to talk about a practical lesson that talks about really one of the things the Bible says a lot about. If we ever think about how we relate to other people, even our enemies. Psalm 25, verse 19, the Bible says, here David says, look upon my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with violent hatred. And so that begins our thoughts about this lesson. David had some enemies, and we're going to look at today dealing with our enemies, because there's times we need to learn how to interact even with those who are, are really hateful toward us and who have things against us and will try to hurt us in a lot of ways. An enemy is defined as a person who actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. That's what the definition would tell us. This would actually be a good lesson for our great words of the Bible. As we're actually kind of looking at it like this today as we're looking at dealing with our enemies in this way. And there are some synonyms, words that are similar to these. There are words that we use often interchangeably with the word foe, adversary, opponent, rival, nemesis. We don't use that word very much, but there's times we may use that word. Uh, antagonist, uh, combatant, challenger, or a competitor. Those are kind of words that are uh, really mean the same when it comes to this idea of having someone who's against us, who doesn't like us in some ways, and they're trying to hurt us in, in things that they do here in this life. But I will suggest, though, that it's not a sin to have enemies. As we think about people of God, and there's times when People in the Old Testament, there were men of the Old Testament that had enemies, and they were people who had struggles with, with people who tried to hurt them in many ways, attack and hurt and kill uh, because of the enemies. There were armies. They would fight against David, fought against Goliath as he was that giant of an enemy. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, here the Bible would say, David said, you come in with a sword and with a spear and of the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. So Goliath was his enemy that day. He was bested by David with God's help as God directed everything. King Saul sadly was David's enemy. The Bible tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 28 and 29, that, that Saul realized that God was with David and his spirit was with him and that uh, he looked at David as an enemy. The Bible says Saul was still more afraid of David in verse 29, so Saul became David's enemy continually. And so that shows us his, his attitude was one of not friendliness, not of trying to be with him and be on the same side of Israel, but one of competition. He saw David as someone as a competitor. And it's sad, even sadder, you might think, that Absalom, the very son of David, became his worst enemy as he tried to uh, have an insurrection. He actually went against his father and, and tried to take over the kingdom. Second Samuel 16, verse 11, here David says, See how my son who came from my body, my own body, seeks my life. And so he was against his father. He went and went war uh, trying to kill his own father. So Absalom was not a good son and because of that. And so there sometimes the saddest part is the when people of our own family become our enemies. Elijah had some enemies because of the truth. And Elijah was a man of God who stood for truth and right, yet he had some enemies. Ahab and Jezebel in 1 Kings 21, 20. Uh, the Bible talks about when he meets with, up with uh, uh, Ahab specifically. So the Bible says, so Abraham, Ahab said to Elijah, rather, have you found me, O oh, my enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And that tells us a lot about people who 
are that way, those who are selling themselves to do evil and sour are naturally going to be the enemies of God's people. And a man like Elijah will not have much common with Ahab and the king because of his evil ways. And that's true, isn't it? Because of, of the rub there, because of the, uh, the difference in the lifestyles and the way one's pleasing God and the other's not trying to please God. He's doing himself a lot of harm by his wickedness and selling himself over to do evil on the side of the Lord. Then there's Daniel. We can look at man in the Old Testament. He was Because he was doing right, he was in that far country because of the Israelites had been taken over. And there's governors and satraps. In Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, they saw Daniel as a threat. They saw him as being greater than them. They tried to take him down. And so they did that by accusing him with his God and his loyalty. He tried to use that in a way against the king, Darius. Uh, he tried to get him to, and actually they did get him to sign a law in that no one could pray to man or God for 30 days except the king. And so he signed that in the law, not thinking or not realizing the reason why they were doing that. It was to try to get at uh, Daniel and destroy him and take him out of the way. So that's how, what's what the enemies do. They try to take you out. They don't want to have you in their lives. They will oftentimes be malicious and in their behavior because of that very thing. And then there's Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter two, verse 10. He had some enemies by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah. Sanballat was an honorite and Tobiah was an Ammonite. And so they were not of the Israelite nation. And so they were against the people of God. And in chapter 2, verse 10, it says they were actually displeased. They were disturbed, rather, that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. And so if they had been a friend to the Israelites, that would not have been a problem. They would have, you know, friends, they don't, don't want to see us to have harm. But our enemies do want to see our harm. That's exactly what they fought them every step of the way, trying to build the walls of Jerusalem back. So that's, that, that became their enemy because of that. Nehemiah was not doing anything wrong, but doing what was right in rebuilding those walls. And then there's Mordecai, who had an enemy named by the name of Haman, a very famous enemy. He was the one who tried to kill all the Jews. In chapter 5, verse 9, it was that he, he, when he saw Mordecai not bowing down to him, he became his enemy that day. He was mad and upset about that. In chapter 7, verse 6, it actually mentions him being the enemy of the Jews. And in chapter 3, verse 10, actually as early as that, as him being that in chapter 8, verse 1 as well. So he was an enemy of the people of God and all the Jews. That's why Queen Esther had to come out and say, you know, this Haman, who was this wicked enemy, a foe, and so he was the one who was striving to get the Israelites, all of them, exterminated. So he definitely was an enemy. But it's not a sin to have enemies. There's some in the New Testament that had enemies. There's many godly men who were trying to do right, and yet they had enemies. John the Baptist had a, an enemy by the name of Herodias, which was a woman. She did not like what he said about her marriage to King Herod, and so therefore uh, she tried to get him, actually did get his head on a silver platter. He was, and that's all because John the Baptist was doing what was right, but yet because of wickedness and sin, there's times when that will bring you enemies. And even Jesus, our very Lord, and the Jewish leaders, they saw him as an enemy in chapter 22, 15, and 26, verse 4. You can look those scriptures up. But we know well why it was. They delivered him over to Pilate for envy. They didn't want Jesus to be having the position that he had and taking away their esteem and, and preeminence. And so they became the enemy of Jesus. They tried to put him to death because of his popularity with people and the common people hear him gladly and such as that was the case. And Stephen found some fellow Jews who were his enemies. In chapter 7, 54 and 57, that's why he was there at the council because he was taken because these men were disputing with him and they made some accusations against Stephen. That's why he was eventually was stoned for blasphemy, but yet he was still doing what God said 
and the charges to God's verdict and his approval did not stick because Stephen was a man of God who followed the will of God. And we think about the Apostle Paul who did so much in helping churches be established and to do a lot of the writing of the New Testament. He had some enemies as well. As his fellow Jews in chapter 9, verse 23, who tried to kill him at various times, not just in that chapter. That starts the beginning when they hear that he's preaching the word of God and now they are trying to be his enemy because of that. Demetrius, the silversmith, who actually stirred up all the other silversmiths of the great goddess of Diana, and they tried to get rid of Paul because he was, they fought against him because he was teaching there's only one true God, and yet they didn't like the message of that. So they became Paul's enemy that day. And then there's Alexander the coppersmith. We don't know a lot about this particular character, but he was an enemy of truth and right, and Paul, the apostle, mentions that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, to beware of him. He didn't mean much evil, is what Paul would say about this character, Alexander the coppersmith. And so again, I think he's probably similarly to what Demetrius was doing in trying to make these silver shrines. But whatever the case was, we know that he was not a friend of Paul. And we think about, though, who is our greatest enemy? Our greatest enemy is the devil himself. First Peter 5, verse 8 tells us, be sober, uh, be so of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. That says a lot about who he is. He's not our friend. He's not someone we can play around with, but he is our enemy who's against us. And as Peter would say, he's out to destroy us like a lion who tries to destroy the prey and just tears up and destroys the life of that animal. And so he does not want our well-being, but to hurt us, maliciously hurt us. In Revelation 12, verse 10, the Bible mentions there, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And so he refers to him as an accuser. That's, again, what's what enemies do. They accuse us of things and they try to, hurt us in those ways. But it's the truth that we speak and live by often that creates enemies. And that is a fact, isn't it? When we are trying to do what's right, there are people naturally that are trying to do things that are wrong, that they don't like us because we condemn them without actually even saying a word because of our life, our character, the fact that we are striving to serve God and they're not, and they're trying to do things that are wrong in that way. So there is a certainly true in our relationship with the world. It's Matthew 14, verse 4. Again, John the Baptist referring to that. Uh, John 15, 18 to 20. Take your Bible and turn over there if you will. I want to read this particular passage. In John chapter 15, Jesus says something about this. Now he mentions the fact that if the world, if you were on its side, the world would love you and you would be a friend to it. But because of that, because of our life and our style and our character, of, which is going toward godliness, it, it's not something the world is offering friendship to us. In verse 18, the Bible says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. In verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, then they will keep your words, yours also. And so Jesus is warning them about the fact that if you go to certain places, you may take your life and, and risk because of that. Because And there are several times that actually plays out. First Peter 3, chapter 4, 3 and 4 talks about how some think it's strange that we don't run with them like we used to, the same excess of rioting. And they speak evil as malignous because of our change in our lives. And we're trying to live right rather than wrong anymore. And that naturally happens. And we try to live by the truth of God people who will not congratulate us, but will try to be our enemy because of that. Jesus said it would be so, uh, be of, of true families. 
uh, should be true of families that are trying to serve uh, God and do what's right. In Matthew chapter 10, he said, your enemies are of your own household. And we have to learn not to love mother or father, sister or brother, more than we love Christ. But yet, a man's foes would be of his own household. And that's sad. How when that happens? Think about Cain, who killed his own brother. And so that was, again, a showing that sometimes family can do that. Joseph's and his brother who sold him into slavery. And at times they were not being treating him like a, a family member, but one who's an enemy. And so that can be true in that regard. But sadly, the truth can also create enemies inside the church. As we think about Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, here Paul would say to the Galatians, because they were listening to these Judaizers, he said, am I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I, am I become someone who's antagonistic to you because of the way I'm, what I'm telling you, the truth of God's word that these Judaizers are wrong and sinful in that, in that doing what they do. And so we think about the prophets even, how when God's people, man, the Old Testament, how they would even stone and persecute and kill the very prophets of God. And it happens in the Old and New Testaments where people, because of the truth, will have that uh, problems with enemies. But we see also the enemies of the cross. In Philippians chapter 3, 18 and 19, the Bible says, For many walk, of whom I've told you, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are in the enemies of Christ, or enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. This is really talking about the enemies that Paul would deal with. There's times when people would be, be friendly to him and he'd have good relationships with those around him, but it's not always the case. He mentions some who hate the cross of Christ and hate what it stands for. And so there'd be those who you make public enemies of. And so that's why we see Paul talking about Alexander Coppersmith and Demetrius and others who did those kind of things. But God gives us instructions how to deal with our enemies. This is the practical side of this. How do you relate uh, in some ways to your enemies? How do you have any kind of good relationship with them? Now, it's very difficult. It's called, it can be a one-sided relationship where they're always on attack mode and trying to hurt us, but yet we're trying to, best as we can, not fall into that trap. And I would say, first of all, our first point is do not participate in senseless arguing and bickering with your enemy. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will, be, will also be like him. That tells us a lot about you simply get into that kind of, of senseless and arguing and bickering. It makes us look just as bad as that person. And we don't want to stoop down to that kind of behavior. And so we don't answer. There's times we just simply have to ignore what people say. And if they're saying things about us, you know, just let it run off our back like a duck. You know, that's, that's the old saying. Just, let, just don't let it get to you, in other words. And so we don't answer that uh, a fool according to his folly. And then verse 5 says, answer a fool as his folly deserves, that he will not be wise in his own eyes. There's times we may have to answer the things just to say, well, this is really not the way it is, and clear up things. And we can sometimes we'll, uh, do those kind of things without being ugly, without trying to get down to the point where we're screaming and hollering and doing those kind of things that are wrong in God's sight. So we want to be very careful not to fall into those kinds of traps. Avoid name calling and those kind of things because that's really one of the things that happens all the time. Your enemies try to bring you down. They try to get you to do things you shouldn't do. And, and there's a temptation. Uh, on the back of this, think about this. In the back of the scene of all this, the devil's trying his best to get all this to go and, and to look bad to the world. So we had to avoid name calling and foul language. Colossians 3, verses 8 to 10 says we can't be that way as a child of God. Remember who we are, that we're a child of God. In verse 8, the Bible says, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Have you ever heard children of God 
get lured into this kind of name calling and using foul language and, and ugly words, well, it's a shame when it happens because that's not the way God wants us to be. Verse 9 tells us, Do not lie to one another since you have laid aside the old self with his evil practices. In verse 10, and, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. In other words, we put on a new self, and we cannot do the things we used to do and say words we used to say. And we need to avoid losing our temper or your temper, becoming angry. You know, you, you can stop that if you can. Belay your anger in some ways. Proverbs 15 verse 1 actually speaks to that. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And that says a lot about how we react. Because if we bring the same kind of tone, the same kind of words that they're using toward us, that, that's only going to make things worse. It just stirs up the anger, and it keeps that going. It, feels, it actually puts more fuel to the fire of an argument, and, and everything gets out of control when we get angry and upset in that way. So God doesn't want us to be that way. And avoid making scenes or public confrontations that are ugly, immature, and unproductive. That just simply, uh, we ought to know by common sense, that's not the way to be as a child of God, to simply get out in public, especially doing that, and making scenes. Oftentimes, that's what people want to do. They want to try to pick a fight and with, the, with a child of God and, and you'll make them look bad. So, oh, you see what they did? They're not the child of God. And they'll say, use those kind of things against us if, we, if they try to bait us and we take the bait and making a big scene. And it's the only, only thing it is, it's an ugly behavior. And it's immature in a lot of ways. And it doesn't produce anything. It's unproductive in any way. And remember who you are, as I mentioned, who you are as a child of God, a Christian. Matthew 10, verse 16 tells us, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And we remember exactly who we are in this way. God wants us to act in ways that are not ugly in this way. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, the Bible says the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, and perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. If we get down on the same level and try to act like our enemies do and try to hurt one another and, and say things, I'm going to get even with you in some way, then that's not going to help them. We simply need to, to be patient with them, able to teach them. And if they're ever going to know what's right, we need to sit down and pray for them that they have come to the knowledge of the truth, that God will grant them to that. But God gives us, again, instructions on how to deal with our enemies. We need to make every effort to res resolve the problem, the situation, in a calm and peaceful manner. Matthew 5, verse 9 refers to us as peacemakers, for they is, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. And then the, also it reminds us in Matthew chapter 5, take your Bibles and turn over there, if you will. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus actually talks about this in verse 25 of that same chapter. He says, make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and to be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid the last cent. That's basically saying, you need to clear this up before it goes to the law and to a court and things like that. Make every attempt to do what's right and get that out of the way before that goes too far and then things just get out of hand. It says, if they're in the wrong, appeal to honesty, fairness, and what is right. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, here the Bible says the righteous man walks in his integrity. And that's what we have to cling to. And as a child of God, we're not holier than thou. But we're simply, simply trying to do what God says to do and be what God wants us to be. And with our enemies, there's times when if they're in the wrong, we just simply appeal to what is right and say, well, this is what's right, what's fair, what's equitable. And they may reject that. And they may see that later on if they sit down and think about, well, this person was right about this. 
in this way because of that. But always let truth prevail. What Let what is right and honorable prevail in our lives as well. And love your enemies and do good to them. Matthew 5, verse 44, in that same chapter of Matthew 5, he says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so what does that mean, to love your enemies and to pray for them? And Luke 6, verse 27, even goes in farther and says, do good to those who hate you. And so that is hard, is very challenging, isn't it? When someone is showed in many ways that they hate us and they're trying to hurt us in a lot of ways, they've done things, maybe destroyed our property in some ways or stolen something from us or in some ways slandered our good name before others and, and make accusations and things like that, it can be very challenging to deal with those kind of things. But what we have to do is simply look to God and say, well, this is exactly what I should do as a child of God, a Christian. Love this enemy and yet pray for them and, and do good to them. Romans chapter 12, 17 to 21 actually is one of the greatest passages that it talks about this. And every child of God has to come to this passage and realize this is the way we need to react. Not in ugly ways, the worldly ways, but simply do what Paul says. He says, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, Paul says, as much as it depends on you, live peacefully with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For his written vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That says a lot about who we are as people of God. We need to have that attitude of, is that person who's my enemy? Can I show goodness to them? Can I show love to them in that way? You know, the Bible actually says in the Old Testament, in Exodus 23, verse 4 and 5, if you meet your enemy's ox or his, his donkey wandering away, you shall surely return it to him. Don't be like this attitude, well, he's my enemy, and I don't care about his donkey or his ox. That was back in the Old Testament. They, they had to do that, didn't they? They had to bring it back to them to show that kind of, of what's fair, what's honorable, because you know, we would want somebody to do that to us or for us in, a, in that situation. And verse 5 says, if you see the donkey or one who hates you lying helpless under its load, you shall refrain from leaving it to him you shall surely release it with him. And so in other words, you see that donkey that's, that's hurting in some way, you help that situation. And, and you be someone who is a, a blessing rather than a curse to that situation. That that's really takes some effort, doesn't it, to do that very thing. And finally, this is a principle that many people really need to look at as well, is what Proverbs 24 verse 17 that clearly tells us don't rejoice when your enemy is down when he has a bad day when there's things happens to him when he falls the bible says do not rejoice when your enemy falls and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles and that's something that we're often trained by movies and and all kinds of of things of the world where people do this all the time they laugh when somebody their enemy falls and they're taught to rejoice you know, in these movies, many times they set up someone to be the enemy of the hero of the story. And it's all a big buildup. At the end of the movie, he has a bad day. And really, he falls. And so everybody's rejoicing. That's usually the credits come at the end of the movie. And, and everybody's rejoicing because that enemy got what he deserved. Now, we should actually be sad that that actually happens because the person who's our enemy when they lose everything, especially they lose their life in some way, they've lost everything. And so the Lord will judge us if we do that. He even says in the next verse that don't be uh, glad because of this because he may take that and reverse that if that was the case. But God gives us instruction again what to do. We need to pray earnestly and sincerely for the problems to cease and for the good of the enemy, that they will come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. Matthew 5, verse 44, we pray for our enemies who persecute us. He says in verse 
45, though, so that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the just. I have that on the action of the scripture there on the board. But you see, we're to be perfect like our heavenly father. And he simply doesn't withhold things because someone's not his children doing his ways. But we do this because we are, because we're trying to be like God in that way that we're trying to be fair and part, not partial against our enemies in some ways. So we are to serve God in that way and pray for strength and courage. There's times we may need to say, well, Lord help me to be what I need to be because of this person who's this antagonistic person who's trying to do things against me and the wisdom to do always what's right. That really is something we need as well to know the, what to do because don't let our feelings and our emotions get the better of us and say, well, you know, because I hate this person. Don't get to the level that we need to stay so I love, they love my enemies. That doesn't mean these warm, fuzzy feelings when we see that person. It means put their well-being first and have that kind of agape love that refers to the well-being of that person, like Jesus who loved us, even though we were enemies against him because of our sins. And there, number two says, if all has been tried and still no resolution, give it over to God to deal with it. There's times when we have to take this burden to the Lord and leave it there. And so there's times, take it to the cross. Take it where God will be able to do things. Maybe God will work in their life because of our prayers for them. And so maybe help them in some way to see the knowledge of the truth and change their mind about what they're doing and being our enemy. And trust in God. That's really the point. We need to trust in God and not to give in to bitterness, resentment, and hatred, and vengeance, and malice. There's all kinds of negative things. This unforgiving spirit that we might have towards someone because of our enemies. In Psalm 25, the Bible speaks of there. Here David talks about some of the things he went through and some of the things that caused him a lot of problems. In Psalm 25, Here's one of the passages I want to read. Verses one through five says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I, in you I trust. Do not let me ashamed. Do not let my enemies exult over me. In thee, none of those who wait for you will be ashamed. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be ashamed. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all the day. So we just simply let God take care of these things. Don't try to do it ourselves. Like I said, vengeance is mine, Romans 12 tells us, that we, God will repay the enemies. And one day God will give us victory over our enemies. And that's something we don't rejoice about. Again, Psalm 7 talks about that, how there's rejoicing times when David would rejoice because he had helped him in some ways. He said, oh, Lord, my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me, or he will tear me, tear my soul like a lion, dragging me away while there's none to deliver. Oh, Lord, my God, if, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to my friend or plundered him who without cause was my adversary. Let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it and let him trample my life down to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift up uh, your, yourself against the rage of my adversaries and arouse yourself for me. You have appointed judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples encompass uh, you and over them return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Vindicate me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. O oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tries the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge. And we see that actually played out in the story of, of Haman, how that the evil he wanted for Mordecai actually was turned upon himself. The same gallows that he made to kill Mordecai on, that's exactly what he received in the end. So God's a God of justice who gives victory. And when does that happen? Well, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 refers to the judgment day. All us will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 
And 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 9, he says it's a righteous thing for God to give vengeance or, or give punishment to those who trouble you. And so all those things he will do in that final day. Jesus, his enemies will be defeated. In Hebrews 1, verse 13, the Bible tells us, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That says a lot about what one time when Jesus will defeat all the enemies. There's coming a day that will happen where all the enemies, in 1 Corinthians 15, that last enemy, which is death, even that last enemy will be destroyed. And so we wait one day for God to vindicate our lives. All enemies will fall on that day. And so we don't have to do all the things against enemies, but simply wait on the Lord to do that very thing. And I hope this lesson has been beneficial to you in some way. Some of the things we've talked about today, we've looked at the things that be of God and say, well, what does God say about interacting with enemies and things that they're doing? Well, we need to have that in our lives as servants of God, that we're going to do what's right and live for him each and every day. Have a good day today. And if you have enemies, do good to them and love them and, and pray for them that they will be saved in some way and, and they'll no longer be your enemies. Have a good day today. Until then, next time we'll uh, have a, a good day, hopefully. Next week I'll be gone uh, on vacation with my family, so we'll not have a lesson next week. But I will hope that the week after that we'll be at back again studying God's Word on Wednesday. Have a good day today. Bye-bye.